Finn. Hey, so um, welcome everybody. Welcome to the IQB seminar. So my name is Wei Dai. I'm a system professor at Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience and a resident faculty at Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine. So today is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Leah Cohen, is an expert in the field of fungal biology and antifungal drug development. So Leah received her doctor degree in microbial genomics, evolution, and infectious disease from the University of Toronto and postdoc training at MIT, where she developed a research program integrating genomics and experimental evolution to examine the influence of protein folding. Then currently, Leah is a professor of molecular genetics at the University of Toronto and also holds the position of vice president in research, innovation, and strategic initiatives. So Leah's research is really focuses on antifungal drug resistant mechanisms and new strategies to address fungal infections. So her exceptional research effort have been widely recognized and published in many high impact journals, including Science, Nature Journals, and PNAS, with over 120 papers to her name. So Leah has received many awards and honors, very long list. So I'm just gonna mention a few, including the prestigious Canadian and Canada Research Chair in Microbial Genomics and Infectious Disease. She was elected as an AAAS Fellow in 2020 and co-director of the Canadian Institutes for Advanced Research on Fungal Kingdom. And also she was elected to Fellowship of the American Academy of Microbiology in 2018. And she's also the recipient of the Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Award. So today, Leah will be speaking to us with her latest research on novel antifungal for treatment of drug-resistant fungal infections. So please join me in welcoming Leah. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Wei, for the uh, introduction and the invitation to participate. I'm sorry I'm not there in person uh, and uh, glad to at least be able to, to communicate with folks. Uh, I understand that you can share questions in the chat, uh, so that will be great. And I look forward to engaging in person at a, at a future event. So what I want to do is tell you a little bit about our work. I will note I am not a computational or structural biologist, but our work uh, engages intensively in both of those spheres. We're highly collaborative and have all kinds of interdisciplinary teams as we approach the grand challenges and opportunities presented by the fungal kingdom. So firstly, just to orient you on uh, why we're so interested in these organisms, uh, they are fundamental to virtually every aspect of life on this planet. Land plants would not have colonized land without the impact of, of fungi and enabling nutrient cycling. Uh, they are fundamental as model organisms. They enable many aspects of our uh, food and culinary diet. They also make all kinds of natural products, including uh, antibiotics, as well as medicines that we use for modulating immune function. But fungi also pose a tremendous threat to many aspects of life on our planet. So an example is they provide a very severe threat uh, to food security as devastating pathogens of, of many of our crops. They are the only organisms causing extinctions in real time as we're seeing uh, amphibians and other species being wiped out. There are also significant threats uh, to human health, and this has been really underappreciated uh, until very recently. So there's over 600 species that are associated with humans, uh, some as commensal, some as pathogens. Individuals with weakened immune systems tend to be the most vulnerable, uh, but there are other fungi for which uh, even healthy individuals are at risk. And I will note that fungal diseases have been increasing uh, in humans, and this has been tracking with the advent of modern medical treatments, including antibiotics, immunosuppressive drugs, and indwelling medical devices. So it's becoming more widely recognized in the public media and beyond uh, that we're all covered uh, with fungi. As humans, we're inhaling lots and lots of spores uh, every day of fungi, uh, and there's a growing sort of recognition that they have a profound uh, impact on, on human health. 
So we've seen this acutely in the context of the COVID pandemic uh, as uh, immune deficiencies and other aspects of deteriorated lung function uh, has rendered uh, patients vulnerable uh, to fungal infections. So we've seen a quite a significant increase in, in these infections around the world. I will also note that this year, the World Health Organization uh, recognized uh, fungi and fungal pathogens with a, a document that reported on high risk pathogens and in particular a critical priority group of fungal pathogens, which are shown on this slide. And these are all organisms that we work on and focus on in our lab. So I'll note that fungi infect billions of individuals. They kill about 1.5 million people every year, which is at least as many as tuberculosis or malaria. A key piece is that mortality rates often exceed 50%, uh, and that's even with state-of-the-art treatments. And 90% of all deaths are due to a fairly limited number of species, uh, predominantly as tracking with this critical priority group, Candida species, Cryptococcus, uh, and Aspergillus. One of the reasons why mortality rates are so high is that there's really a very limited number of effective antifungal drugs. There's only three major classes of antifungals that are used to treat invasive fungal infections. And these are, are shown on the slide. This is compared to several dozen classes of antibacterial agents. So there's a really limited uh, armamentarium. So on the left, you can see the azoles. Uh, these work by blocking the biosynthesis of a key membrane sterol called ergosterol which is analogous to cholesterol in the fungal cell membrane. These have been around and widely used for decades in medicine and in agriculture. A challenge with azoles is that they tend to be static agents, which means they cause growth arrest, but don't directly kill the fungus, which makes them vulnerable to resistance. In the middle, you can see the polyenes. Uh, these have been around since the 1950s. They work as sort of a, a sponge to extract sterols from the membrane, the same ergosterol uh, target. Uh, they are widely used in extreme circumstances, uh, in part limited because of their extreme host toxicity uh, due to effects on mammalian cholesterol. The only new class of antifungal to reach the clinic in decades are the echinocandins, uh, which have uh, a different mode of action entirely from the two membrane uh, targeting classes. They work by inhibiting the biosynthesis of the fungal cell wall, a key linker molecule. They are effective antifungals. A limitation is they have limited spectrum of activities. So they do not affect cryptococcus species as one example. So we're seeing a growing challenge as resistance has emerged in the clinic to each of the classes of antifungals and is now a major impediment to treatment. We're even seeing uh, species that are resistant to, again, all three uh, classes of antifungals. Many isolates, for example, of Candida auris, which people may have heard of, are resistant to all three classes. So a growing concern that we have uh, an urgent need for new therapeutics. So my uh, lab thinks very uh, creatively and intensively about what are uh, exciting strategies through which we can expand the antifungal target space. So what I'm going to walk you through is some of our approaches with some examples of, of recent work in this space. So one strategy that we employ is a, a sort of genomic forward approach uh, to identify uh, vulnerabilities in fungal pathogens. And I'm going to showcase work predominantly in Candida albicans, as it's one of the most prevalent fungal pathogens of humans, and also one of the, the most genetically tractable. So we have built out very large uh, functional genomic resources, so we can do fairly uh, high throughput uh, and genome scale kinds of analyses. So as you might imagine, there are key strategies that we like to think about uh, would be to identify all the essential genes, genes required for viability of the pathogen, genes required for drug resistance, those critical for the pathogen to cause disease, and those critical for the pathogen to thrive in the host, whether in a commensal context or in the context of a, an actual infection. So for the first vignette, I'm going to give you a little bit of sense of, of how we've gone after essential genes. So just for context, uh, there are 6,600 genes in the Candida albicans diploid genome. About 40% of these have no identifiable homolog in the model yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, although cerevisiae is a fantastic model, the predictive value of gene essentiality for those with genes with a clear ortholog is only 52% for Candida albicans. So basically uh, underscoring the fact that we need to directly study uh, essential genes and gene function directly in the pathogen of interest. 
So there's been some initial work that was done with a transposon mutant collection, um, but we took an approach to build on an initial uh, resource that was started by Merck, and we are now uh, moving forward with completing this genomic resource. So the resource basically, again, it's a diploid genome. So one allele uh, of each gene in the genome is deleted with a marker flanked by two barcodes. Those barcodes are relevant because it allows us to do all kinds of really nice pooled assays where we can track the identity of each strain using uh, sequencing of the barcodes as a great way uh, to track sort of fitness uh, of each mutant in a pooled culture. So one gene deleted, and then for the other allele, the native promoter is replaced by a promoter that we can turn off uh, with tetracycline or the analog doxycycline. So that lets us study all genes, essential or not, simply by turning off expression of our target gene. So we wanted to take a, a really comprehensive approach to identify all the essential genes. We built a great team. Uh, many of these folks are uh, in Toronto on my team. And I will also note we engaged Chad Myers from the University of Minnesota as our computational biologist to help us advance this work. And Shang Zhang was uh, one of his graduate students who was core to this effort. So what we did to start was to build uh, and leverage a machine learning model to predict C. albicans essential genes. So for this, we used all the available data that we could, uh, and they had experience doing this kind of work in Saccharomyces. So we leveraged gene expression, uh, sequence features, uh, essentiality data from Saccharomyces, uh, and the existing data from the transposon analysis in Candida albicans. We uh, built a random forest model uh, and trained the model with 80% of the data so that we could then test on the residual. We then uh, went on to build out uh, a new set of these strains. We built 866 new strains so that we could experimentally validate the predictions of the model. So from this work, we identified 621 uh, C. albicans essential genes. 149 of which lacked a human homologue, which is always a, an advantageous feature for a drug discovery kind of platform or perspective, and four of them lacked any homologue in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So I'm just going to give you one uh, quick example uh, for how we can then use this approach to understand uh, gene function in this pathogen. So here's an example of a gene. It was uh, affectionately called before we had named it uh, 01070C because <laughs> it had no functional characterization. Um, and we predicted it was likely to be a novel uh, component of the kinetochore. So we had done some simple, you know, a blast P and conserved domain searches. It predicted it would be part of the MIS-12 MTW1 family of kinetic core proteins that are part of the mind complex, which is known to bind DNA and recruit the additional uh, kinetic core subunits, including the, the DAM dash uh, complex, which uh, binds microtubules during cell division. So what we did was then uh, ensure we could pull out all the homologs for the 10 components of that complex from Cerevisiae. We confirmed, confirmed that they are essential. So you can see this kind of analysis on the bottom. For those not familiar, this is sort of a spotting assay where we place the yeast directly on a solid agar substrate. And you're seeing a dilution series of uh, the yeast cells, the fungal cells. This on the left is an agar plate uh, without any doxycycline. So the genes are all on. And on the right is with doxycycline where the genes are off. So you can see for all of these cases, when we turn off expression of these genes, the fungal cell cannot grow. So these are essential genes. And you can see for the mind complex, um, all the top three were essential except MTW1, where you could see there is a growth defect, but the cells were viable. So that's an interesting uh, divergence from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So if this KRP1 uh, was really a new component of the kinetic core, we would expect that it would co-localize uh, with this uh, mind complex. And uh, that's indeed what we found. So we had a GFP tagged uh, proteins for KRP1, for example, as well as uh, tagging components of the, the complex uh, with RFP. And we're able to show that they co-localize consistent uh, with this function at the kinetic core. So we also did immunoprecipitation coupled to mass spectrometry and discovered that KRP1 interacts with eight out of the 10 dash dam complex members and all the mind complex members. Uh, so confirming again that this is indeed likely uh, what uh, its function is involved in the kinetic core. So a neat piece for C. albicans is that when we perturb cell cycle uh, function uh, or perturb the kinetic core specifically, what we see is this dramatic change in morphology from this yeast form growth that you can see with the wild type on the top 
to a filamentous form, which you can see here uh, with this agent that impairs cell cycle progression, hydroxyurea. So radical shift in morphology uh, and has all kinds of implications for virulence, where the capacity to transition between the two is critical for virulence. So consistent with this role in, in cell cycle, we found that modest transcriptional repression of each component of the dash dam complex and the mine complex induces filamentation. And you can see this, this here uh, on, on the slide, where when we add doxycycline to turn off expression of those genes, we get dramatic uh, induction of, of filamentation without any other sort of inducing cue. Things like serum are known to stimulate filamentation, but here we have no inducing cue, just simply turning off expression. So we've been able to take this uh, to the next level, and this is all uh, really recent work that's all unpublished. So I'm just going to sort of highlight sort of where we're headed uh, with this kind of work. So this is led by Emily Shang, uh, and what she's doing is taking advantage of those barcodes that I mentioned. So that means we can pool all of our mutants, so our thousands of mutants together, and we can assay them for fitness in as many conditions as we would like, which is much faster than in the arrayed format that's much more labor intensive. So we basically set up a, a sort of compendium of eight different conditions that had relevance to the host. So elevated temperature uh, in the presence of serum, osmotic stress, iron starvation, uh, nutrient uh, deprivation, membrane stress, and, and these kinds of conditions. And we then screened to identify the gene sets uh, where mutants were um, had a, important for fitness or deletion of a particular gene conferred a fitness deficit. Uh, in any one of these environments. So we identified uh, over 200 genes important for fitness in the organism. Uh, and some of them were important in uh, one condition and some of them were important in all conditions. So this kind of approach identified both condition independent and condition dependent uh, genes important for fitness. So in this kind of plot, what you're looking at, these are the, the different conditions you can see uh, listed um, along just below the axis of the plot. And uh, the graph is showing the, the number of mutants that had a fitness deficit in those particular conditions with the black dot uh, indicating the conditions in which that gene set had a, a fitness deficit. So for example, uh, this first set, you'll see there's black dots for every condition. So that means these mutants, the 171 mutants, were defective in fitness in all of these environmental conditions. So these are genes important for fitness in all assayed conditions, suggesting that they were important for core cellular functions like cell cycle, translation, DNA replication, and, and so on. We also had this uh, large set of uh, genes that were important for a specific number of conditions, and you can see that varies hugely across the plot. So these are genes that are important for fitness in select conditions, and we've gone on to figure out the function of many of these genes, many of which were uncharacterized, and this includes you know, functions in thermal tolerance, for example, in membrane stress response and beyond. So just sort of highlighting that uh, this kind of functional genomic approach provides a really powerful strategy to discover gene function and to identify genes important for fitness. And I will note in collaboration with Suzanne Noble at UCSF, we're now uh, doing these experiments in mouse models of commensalism and virulence. Again, we can take advantage of the barcodes so we can uh, assay pools of mutants uh, in these models and identify genes important for commensalism and important for virulence. So I think a, a really powerful strategy uh, moving forward. So here, I promised we we're going to talk a little bit about drug discovery. So we're now going to turn uh, from thinking about genes and identifying targets to thinking about molecules, which is a, obviously a very important part of the equation. So we do this using lots of approaches. We screen lots of libraries of compounds from all different kinds of sources. Uh, and once we identify interesting bioactives, we then are engaged with identifying their targets. And to do so, uh, we leverage a number of approaches, sort of chemogenomic profiling, which I'll highlight, genome sequencing of resistant mutants, and uh, structure-enabled uh, drug design to then pursue our sort of optimization strategies. So I mentioned we screen lots of libraries. This is just a, you know, a few examples of the kinds of libraries that we're screening. We've worked with collaborators to the Recon Institute to screen uh, libraries of about 30,000 natural products and derivatives and drug-like compounds. Uh, we have collaborators at Boston University who've provided fantastic libraries of molecules. We've worked with the Broad Institute. Uh, we've worked with the NIH. Uh, 
GlaxoSmithKline and, and others. So just giving you a sense of the kinds of molecules we've, we've engaged with. <clears throat> so here's an example where we were then uh, interested in kind of leveraging our genomic approach uh, and intersecting that with our chemical biology approach. So we screened a large collection of compounds. In particular, this one was from the University of Tokyo's chemical library. Uh, 10,000 molecules to identify those with potent single agent activity. So meaning that compound alone was sufficient to sort of abolish growth uh, of the organism. And so you would predict then that the compound would likely target an essential gene or an essential process because inhibition of that gene or product or process is sufficient to block growth. So this work was led by Alice Shu. And uh, she found an interesting compound called NPBTA, which potently inhibits growth of candida species. So in this particular plot, uh, growth is displayed as a heat map format. So green is growth, black is no growth. And you can see a concentration gradient of the compound. And you can see that C. albicans is the most sensitive of the set of species shown here. So that was cool. We got a compound. We figured it targeted an essential gene. So to get an idea of which gene product it might be targeting, we screened a library of C. albicans heterozygous double card barcoded deletion mutants. So this is basically the, the set uh, that I spoke about, but before we've then promoted or replaced the remaining allele. So for that one, we have about 90% coverage of the genome and we can do these pooled assays and look for which mutants are hypersensitive to the compound which typically is a great strategy to identify putative drug targets. So if there's less of the drug target around, the mutant should be hypersensitive to the, the compound. That's the sort of logic. So we identified uh, one uh, hypersensitive mutant that was uh, most extremely hypersensitive. This was heterozygous for GLN4, which encodes a glutaminal tRNA synthetase required to add glutamine to its cognate tRNA. So that was great, uh, but whenever we do pooled assays, we wanna then do validation. So what we did was pull out the individual strains, including this one here, which is our strain where we have one allele of GLN4 deleted and the second allele under this promoter that we can turn off. So what we found here, again, green is growth. You can see for the wild type strain, adding this doxycycline or tetracycline has no impact as expected, that's the control. But for the GLN4 strain, when we turn off expression of GLN4 or dial it down, the strain becomes hypersensitive. So consistent with the compound potentially targeting GLN4. So we always like to show things in more than one way. So we then selected for resistant mutants. What we uh, did that by just plating the mutants, plating the cells onto drug plates. Uh, so with a high concentration of drug, isolated resistant mutants did sequencing and found that all of them had mutations in GLN4 that were conferring resistance. So that's again, compelling evidence that we reduce dosage, we confer hypersensitivity, and we get mutations that confer resistance for GLN4. So given that GLN4 is a glutaminal tRNA synthetase, we would expect then that the molecule would inhibit translation. And we indeed confirmed that the molecule inhibits translation using a, a reporter assay. So it does so in C. albicans and it does not in human cells. So that's encouraging that it's sort of a fungal selective or fungal specific mode of action. We then collaborated with Dave Suchantha uh, and Jerry Wright at McMaster University, and we were able to solve the crystal structure of this uh, GLN4 bound to NPBTA. And we found that it binds, interestingly, at an allosteric site, which is highly unusual. So it's not binding to the substrate binding site. It binds at an allosteric site between the Rossman fold and the MKS loop. And based on this binding, you can see the overall uh, crystal structure here and, and the uh, binding sort of more closely uh, in this particular schematic. So based on, on this analysis, we expected uh, that the binding of NPPTA would uh, hinder mobility of this MKS loop. And by doing so, impair interactions with side chains and, and block enzymatic activity. That was the expectation. So we were able to work with Jerry's team to develop a biochemical assay uh, for GLN4 activity. And what you can see quite clearly is that we get concentration dependent inhibition of, of enzymatic activity, again, consistent with the molecule targeting GLN4. So it's a fantastic uh, sort of story. We've then been able to show that the target GLN4 is critical for virulence in the mouse. So if we take a, a candida albicans strain that lacks GLN4, it is completely avirulent. 
The molecule sadly has some liabilities, so it's not stable uh, and we need to optimize the molecule to be able to use it uh, in, in a clinical kind of or preclinical development program. So we're working on that with chemists and, and making sure we can advance that, that program. So we've talked a little bit about targeting essential genes, which is one of our major focuses, but another focus is to identify genes and molecules that modulate drug resistance. And the idea here is this would expand the antifungal target space, more targets because there's more combinations of that sort, and it opens a route to combination therapy, which has really become a standard of care for bacterial infections, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, but has been less well explored uh, for fungi. So to do so, in this case, it was Callie Iyer who led the charge, and she screened a chemical library from Boston University of about 2,500 molecules, and she was looking for those that would enhance the activity of the azoles, which you'll recall target uh, block biosynthesis of the membrane, sterol or gosterol, against candida oris, which was that emerging fungal pathogen that's highly uh, drug resistant, uh, and many, many, many isolates are resistant to azoles. So she was looking for molecules specifically that enhanced azole activity, and she discovered uh, this compound, which we uh, christened as azofluxin, which synergizes with the widely used azole fluconazole against the oris, uh, and we named it azofluxin for azole efflux inhibition. So what you can see here is, is uh, what we call sort of a, a checkerboard assay. So we're looking at titration of the azole compound on the y-axis, a dilution series, and a dilution series of our new azofluxin compound along the x-axis. Again, green is growth. So you can see either compound alone has virtually no activity. Again, this is an azole-resistant isolate. But you can see the combination uh, completely blocks fungal growth. So this is a, a really classic plot of drug synergy, either alone has limited effect, but the combination uh, creates a, a very potent antifungal activity. So what we discovered was that azofluxin increases the intracellular levels of fluconazole and potentiates the activity of other intracellular acting compounds against Cioris in a manner that depends on an efflux transporter called CDR1. So we think that azofluxin is inhibiting CDR1 uh, and thereby enhancing the activity of many compounds, fluconazole included, compounds that would normally be effluxed um, by this transporter. So it's pretty neat. This We were able to explore the therapeutic potential of azofluxin. And in this particular assay, uh, we're using a cell culture, uh, co-culture infection assay. So first, in just the gray bars, these is just uh, human cells. They're luciferase expressing human cells, so we can monitor their viability. You can see luminescence on the y-axis. And what you can see is uh, our compound, uh, this is the vehicle, azofluxin alone, fluconazole alone, or the combo, uh, and also a, an even higher concentration of fluconazole for reference. So none of the treatments are toxic to human cells alone. If we look at the co-culture, when we have candida oris, you can see candida oris completely kills the human cells if there's no treatment or azofluxin alone or fluconazole at this relevant concentration for the combination. Again, the candida oris wipes out the human cells. But this combination uh, with this low dose of fluconazole and azofluxin completely rescues the human cells. Uh, and it does so just as well as this really high dose of fluconazole. So we could then look at this in a mouse model because this compound fortunately had better properties than our NPBTA compound. What you're looking at is log kidney fungal burden in a model of candida oris infection. So you can see uh, when our input, uh, we then have a significant increase in fungal burden when we look at the proliferation in the kidney if we don't treat the mice. If we treat with azofluxin, we have significant therapeutic benefit even on its own, which is interesting because that's different than what we saw with the cell culture model where azofluxin alone did not rescue. Fluconazole alone, you'll see rescues and the combination uh, has an even superior effect. Okay, so we've talked about essential genes. Uh, we've talked about uh, genes and our products that are important uh, for drug efflux. And there's another class of targets that we are really excited about and that I'm gonna focus on for the remaining section of the talk. And so this is stress response regulators. And the fundamental premise of why we think this is an exciting strategy is that many of the antifungals are not fantastic at killing the fungal cell. 
So for example, the azoles uh, mess with membrane homeostasis and induces cell membrane stress response. Uh, the echinocandins cause cell wall damage, loss of cell wall integrity, and induce a cell wall stress response. So we then sort of reasoned uh, that if you inhibit stress response regulators, you could dramatically enhance the activity of these antifungal drugs because you sort of cripple their defense systems. You cripple the fungus. So we found that this was indeed the case, and others in the field have also been uh, pursuing this area of inquiry. What you're looking at is a Petri dish here uh, with this antifungal test strip on the dish. The white fuzzy stuff is the fungus, and you can see uh, that without any other compound in the Petri dish, the fungus is resistant and grows right up to the test strip. If we include a stress response inhibitor in the agar at a fixed concentration, what you can see is we now make this azole effective. So now we see this beautiful zone of inhibition where all of a sudden fluconazole in this case can work and inhibit growth of this otherwise azole resistant fungus. Okay, so it's kind of a neat principle. We found that inhibition of key stress response regulators abrogates resistance to all major classes of antifungal drugs in all of the leading fungal pathogens of humans. And we've got lots of, of programs to dissect this. So that's a really neat area. And, and one other concept I'll introduce before showing you uh, some data on an exciting program that I think brings together many of the, the threads that we've talked about so far is the idea of targeting virulence factors. So again, this is kind of thinking outside the box. Uh, you know, we've got essential genes, we've got genes responsible for drug efflux, uh, we've got genes important uh, for stress response, and then also those that are important for virulence as different ways that we can cripple the pathogen in the host. So we know uh, for different fungi, they have different you know, virulence factors or traits that enable them to cause disease. But for candida albicans and for many fungi, morphological transitions are really critical for virulence. So for C. albicans, it transitions, as I've shown you, uh, between a single cell yeast form and a multicellular filamental, filamentous form. You'll all know that it can do this in response to perturbation of cell cycle. It can also do this in response to exposure to serum and to elevated temperature and other host relevant cues. So we know that the yeast form is important for colonization and dissemination. Uh, and the filamentous form is important for invasion of organs and causing host damage. So as I mentioned, morphogenesis induced by many cues, including internalization by host immune cells. So one particular protein uh, that we've been very interested in is a molecular chaperone called HSP90. And it is a core hub of regulatory circuitry that regulates the stability and function of all kinds of client proteins, hundreds of them, uh, including you know, kinases and, and many other key regulators of signaling. HSP90 has emerged as an important target for a number of different diseases. So there's a huge amount uh, of, of literature and understanding of molecules that can engage with the target uh, and it's highly druggable. Uh, so we know that it's important uh, for drug resistance. It's actually essential in fungi. It's important for this morphogenesis uh, and this middle panel, you can see that if we shut off expression of HSP90, we induce this sort of crazy uh, morphological transition. We also know that if we simply turn off expression of HSP90 in the pathogen, we can completely clear an otherwise lethal infection in a mouse model. So you can see kidney fungal burden on this plot on the right. And even if we simply replace the native promoter without turning off expression of that gene, we dampen virulence, suggesting that it's regulated in, in the host. So we thought HSP90 was a fantastic target, right? It's essential, important for drug resistance, important for virulence, uh, you know, really critical uh, to regulate many uh, other cellular targets that are great drug targets and really exciting. So it's kind of the hub. The challenge is that HSP90 is highly conserved and it's also very important in humans and every other system in which it's been studied. So that makes it a challenge to develop molecules that can selectively inhibit HSP90 in the fungus and not inhibit HSP90 in the human host. So we recognized this was a challenge, so we assembled a, a super A team of individuals that bring together all kinds of expertise. We have a pharmacologist, a chemist, a couple structural biologists, an infectious disease clinician, uh, and uh, another pharmacologist and some amazing trainees that have moved forward on this program. 
So we're going to start with Candida albicans. And the first thing we did was we solved the crystal structure uh, of the N-terminal domain. So the N-terminal domain has the ATP binding domain, which is critical for chaperone function. And it's where most of the small molecules that have been in clinical development engage. So when we first started uh, and we solved the structure, not bound to any inhibitor, they were completely identical uh, and we could not differentiate human from fungus, which was uh, slightly concerning for our strategy. We then went on uh, to solve co-crystal structures with a number of inhibitors, including uh, two of them that are shown here. We've done many, many more. And what we could see was in some cases, uh, the, the binding was, was really similar uh, between human and fungus, but in other cases, we did see this differentiation. So you can see with AUI-92 uh, and Avartis compound uh, that we have uh, more significant sort of differentiation in how the compound engages. So that was kind of neat. So we then wanted to, to start on a program uh, where we would synthesize molecules that uh, we thought might be fungal selectivative. So we just sort of were exploring this space. We started with a natural product, HSP90 inhibitors that we knew were bioactive. So they got into fungi and they had potent antifungal activity. So these were uh, radicicol and, and monocillin uh, and embarked on a synthesis of uh, oxime derivatives of these HSP90 inhibitors. So we then needed a good assay so we could differentiate sort of selective binding to the fungal HSP90 versus the human HSP90. And we did so using a fluorescence polarization assay, which is basically monitoring displacement of a labeled uh, probe compound, in this case, uh, displacement of a labeled geldenomycin, which is a natural product that binds to both uh, human and fungal HSP90. So what you can see is that the EC50 or the, the, the binding uh, to the candida protein on the y-axis and the human protein uh, on the x-axis. Uh, we often do this with lysates so that we look at HSP90 complexed with its co-chaperones. Uh, we've also done it with purified protein. So you can see the compounds on uh, this side of the diagonal, on the right of the diagonal are fungal selective, and those on the left would be human selective. So we can then pursue those that are most fungal selective. We've got lots of other tools we can use, including uh, looking at the model yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where we can replace its native HSP90 genes with a single HSP90 from human, from Canada, or really from any other, other species. So what you can see is for radicicol, which was our starting uh, chemical matter, that it is more potent against Saccharomyces when it has only the human HSP90 isoforms. So you can see a lower concentration of radicicol is sufficient to inhibit growth. Whereas for candida, it takes a much higher concentration to inhibit growth. You can see with this particular compound here, uh, 075, which is number one uh, on this uh, fluorescence polarization plot, it's flipped. And now it is more potent against cerevisia that expresses the C. albicans HSP90. So that was pretty neat, uh, but we wanted to figure out what was the basis of this selectivity. So again, we did uh, co-crystal structures of candida albicans, the HSP90 and terminal domain uh, bound to all kinds of different uh, molecules that we had synthesized. So if we started with a molecule that had no fungal target selectivity, um, we saw that there was a very distinct binding mode to molecules that had fungal selectivity. So this one here you can see on the right, uh, you see a conformational change uh, in this pocket that accompanies ligand binding. And so this gave us a bit of a hint of how we could move forward. And I'm just gonna show you sort of an example of the, the kinds of impacts of the selectivity we're achieving. This is our, our lead molecule, that 075 that I mentioned. This is just looking at viability of, of human cells. You can see radicicol has sort of an intermediate toxicity to the human cells. 075 is much less toxic uh, to the human cells. And gonetospib, which is one of the HSP90 inhibitors that had been in clinical development, you can see it's a more potent uh, inhibitor of, of human cell proliferation. So if we look in the context of an infection, uh, this is a co-culture model. The dark red uh, mess uh, is the fungus <laughs> and the, the background lighter kind of color is, is the human cell monolayer. So you can see with no treatment, the fungus overgrows. Treating with just this low concentration of radicicol or gonetospib uh, still leads to fungal overgrowth. Whereas you can see with our 075, it's pretty effective uh, at clearing out the fungus. In fact, as effective as this concentration of, of fluconazole. And you can see the no fungal control on the left. 
So this is great. Uh, and what we've done is gone on uh, to develop more synthetically tractable fungal selective HSP9 inhibitors. So starting with radicicol or monocillin, those were natural products. And so if there are any chemists in the room, uh, they might uh, already begin to understand that there's a challenge with starting with a natural product. Uh, the chemistry was complex. The starting material was limited. So what we wanted to do was develop um, these resorcelate aminopyrazoles, which we call wraps, which would then enable a fully synthetic approach to these uh, fungal selective HSP90 inhibitors. So we've developed, you know, in this particular moment, we had over 130 uh, of these wraps that we made, uh, and we screened them in the same kind of assay for fluorescence polarization. In this case, you're looking at candid albicans selectivity versus human cells on the y-axis, and a different fungus, Cryptococcus neoformans uh, selectivity versus human on the x-axis. So what you'll see with the red dots are these are the fungal selective molecules. And what's kind of interesting is we're seeing quite a different set of molecules that are selective for Cryptococcus HSP90 than those that are selective for C. albicans HSP90. So it suggests that uh, we we um, may have an opportunity to develop fungal selective and also species uh, selective inhibitors of the chaperone protein. So we've confirmed target engagement potency and selectivity uh, with purified protein, as well as for surface plasmin uh, resonance spectroscopy and thermal shift assays. This has all been going beautifully but there was a challenge <laughs> as with every good story, right? There was a, a challenge we had to overcome. And the major challenge was these molecules were getting great selectivity at the target, but had limited whole cell activity. So we engaged further with our chemists. We have uh, Paul uh, Marsic and David Huang, who really dug in and have synthesized well over 300 analogs. And we've now achieved well over 200 fold selectivity at the target. So we, we clearly began learning uh, the key substitutions on these MRAPs that would enable different kinds of selectivity uh, for Candida, for Cryptococcus, for example. Uh, and again, the key was figuring out the strategy for whole cell activity. So we identified a number of molecules uh, that had low selectivity, but reasonable whole cell activity, and those that had good selectivity and no whole cell activity. So that was the challenge was sort of a property-driven optimization of these RAP series to optimize both of those properties at the same time. And, and really, that's been uh, the focus of our, our major program. And to do so, we've been really guided by structural insights, and we've now uh, got great track traction with solving crystal structures, not only for C. albicans, HSP90, which is what I had shown you earlier, but also for C. neoformans, uh, HSP90, always focusing on the N-terminal domain. And here you can see with this um, compound called Lunetus Bib, uh, which, is, which is bound. Uh, and we've done this for many HSP90 inhibitors. So here I'm going to just show you, you know, a few sort of brief highlights, not going deep into the, the details, but to just show you we're able to leverage um, the structural insights uh, to guide our synthesis and we're making some progress in this space. So this is looking at structure activity relationship trends based on uh, some of our analysis. We've got over, you know, several hundred compounds, many of which have high affinity. Uh, the affinity in this particular plot is shown with color. So the more red uh, would be the higher affinity compound uh, and also target selectivity, right? So that's for the fungal target relative to the human counterpart. And in this case, you're looking at cryptococcal selectivity uh, on, on the y-axis. So you can see, for example, we've got a number of compounds that have this sort of uh, brighter sort of red uh, pinkish hue, so indicating that they've got uh, good affinity and also have good selectivity uh, for the cryptococcal protein. And we now have 94 compounds with antifungal potencies that are in very respectable ranges uh, for antifungals that, that are used in the clinic. So here I'm just highlighting, uh, we've, these are you know, hot off the press. So these are structures we just got uh, literally a couple of weeks ago uh, and our structural biologists and chemists are hard at work uh, trying to make sure we can leverage and maximize the insights gained from these structures. I'm not gonna go into the, the details, but uh, I will just say that it's uh, been extraordinarily illuminating uh, and is really helping us drive this program forward. 
So here I just wanted to highlight that in addition to our academic program, where we're focused on uh, discovering these fungal selective HSP90 inhibitors through NIH supported mechanisms, uh, we also have launched a startup company called Bright Angel Therapeutics, where we're taking a very different approach with the same sort of end goal of developing fungal selective molecules of stress response inhibitors. So for the last couple of minutes, I did just want to highlight sort of a, a new way we're thinking about finding these uh, interesting molecules that modulate fungal biology uh, and might serve as interesting new fungal targets. So we've talked a lot about screening libraries and synthetic chemistry. Uh, and here I'm going to say, let's look to nature. Uh, and here we've been thinking about interkingdom interactions in the microbiota and whether we can explore those interactions as a source uh, for potential potential new uh, antimicrobials and, and new targets that could be interesting to explore. So this is uh, work led by Jessie McAlpine, and here uh, she was seized with the observation that uh, bacteria such as lactobacillus are frequently used as probiotics. Uh, and Lalamande is a company we actually had a partnership with to explore this. They develop uh, probiotic lactobacillus. We note that when people take antibiotics, they're more vulnerable to fungal infections. And so there's this connectivity where bacteria may be helping uh, to defend against fungal infections. So what Jesse did was look firstly, here's a control condition where we had just uh, grown the candida under conditions where it filaments. So this is in the presence of serum. If we have candida growing with lactobacillus, so you can see the larger fungal cells are in a sea of these tiny bacterial cells, you can see it's not filamenting. The candida remains as yeast. And we saw that that activity uh, was preserved when we just used lactobacillus conditioned medium. So no bacteria, no live bacteria around, just filtering the supernatant. And that would extract any sort of secreted uh, products from the lactobacillus. That was sufficient to block filamentation. Neat. So we then uh, pursued bioactivity guided fractionation and structural analysis, and were able to identify a single molecule, as you can see here, that was associated with the bioactive fraction that was sufficient to block uh, filamentation of candida albicans. So we were able to both commercially acquire this compound independently, as well as to synthesize it independently and show that this one acetyl beta carboline was sufficient to block filamentation of C. albicans. That's kind of neat. So beta carbolines are, are biogenic amines that are known to have a number of activities. They modulate neurotransmitter activity. These guys have minimal uh, toxicity to human cells. And I note that they inhibit C. albicans filamentation induced by many cues, and they also block biofilm formation. And here you can see uh, the biofilm models, a couple of them. You'll note that I've switched from acetobetacarboline to thoxybetacarboline, and that was not an accident. So what we found was the uh, acetobetacarboline compound was not stable in human cells, so it was metabolized. So uh, another interesting journey where we did some SAR around that initial compound and found a stable beta-carboline, which was this one here, the ECBC. So we've used both a, a C. albicans biofilm uh, model on mouse vaginal tissue and found that our ECBC compound can dramatically reduce biofilm formation. We've also used a rat intravenous catheter model in collaboration with David Andes and shown uh, that the ECBC compound can completely clear uh, a biofilm infection on a, on a catheter in this mammalian model. So I'm not going to go through the, the details, but with a tour de force sort of genetic and genomic analysis, we were able to identify the target of our beta carboline. It seems to inhibit a DYRK, which is dual specificity tyrosine phosphorylation regulated kinase called YAK1. We've mapped out a bit of the pathway. So we know that the molecule blocks YAK1 function, which affects signaling through a particular pathway. Uh, and that signaling is important to enable filamentation. So what I want to do uh, to summarize, and I think hopefully I've left time for a little bit of, of discussion or questions, uh, is to summarize what I've told you today. We started with a genomic approach to understand uh, essential genes in one of the leading fungal pathogens of humans. This was a great strategy to not only characterize gene function, but to identify new antifungal targets, as with the GLN4 glutaminal tRNA synthetase. We talked a bit about development of fungal selective inhibitors, of antifungal efflux or stress response. 
We talked a little bit about mining the microbiota as a strategy to identify new antimicrobials and found one that inhibits a DYRK kinase called YAK1. And sort of more broadly, highlighting that chemical genomic and functional genomic analyses provide a really powerful strategy to identify vulnerabilities in fungal pathogens that can be leveraged to understand host pathogen interactions and guide the development of novel therapeutics. So I will acknowledge phenomenal support from many funders uh, in Canada and in the US, and also many outstanding collaborators from around the world without whom this work would not be possible. We have a fantastic team of graduate students and postdocs and research associates and undergraduates who drive all of the work that I've talked about. And I will just end on this very last slide, just highlighting uh, that in addition to sort of driving this work on human fungal pathogens, I am co-director along with Joe Heitman of a CIFAR program on the fungal kingdom, threats and opportunities, which addresses not only fungal threats to human health, but also fungal threats to agriculture, food security, uh, and wildlife uh, biodiversity. So at that, I am going to stop sharing, I think, and then we could welcome uh, questions uh, from the chat. And I see there's some questions here. So uh, would it make sense, Way, if I read the question and then respond? Yes, to the question? We, uh, you need to read the questions because apparently the question Jason asked only host the panelists can see, so the attendees wouldn't be able to read them. Great, thank you. Uh, excellent. So, first question is: Were the Grace uh, V two mutants all predicted essential? Good question. Uh, and if so, does that imply most predicted essentials were non-essential? So, good question. Um, the first part is no, because we needed to test our model to to engineer mutants that would be predicted to be essential and non-essential, so that we could test the model effectively. So it was a mix. The model had good predictive power, um, substantially better than just taking the Cerevisiae prediction. So that was uh, encouraging and, and uh, validating that the effort to build uh, the machine learning model uh, was was helpful. Um, and it still tells us though that we, we need to just build out the collection. And what we're also finding is that there's a huge amount of condition uh, specificity to essentiality. And that's something that you can really only explore experimentally. So we're building out this, this full data set now for those eight different conditions, as well as looking at essentiality directly in the host. Uh, and I think that will be a key compendium and our computational biologist is deeply engaged with developing robust pipelines for, for analyzing uh, the, the data. So that was a one excellent question. I see one more question uh, currently in the chat, which is that several beta carbolines are non-specific inhibitors of human DYRK, such as harmine. Yes, absolutely. And we've tested harmine uh, and it is also active uh, against Canada and uh, noting that harmine inhibits DYRK1A, 1B, and 2. Uh, and has one ECBC been tested against the human targets yet? I'm trying to make sure uh, that I'm addressing this carefully. I'd have to double check. We've confirmed the, the compound does not have any toxicity to human cells. Uh, and I would have to check back to see if we've done uh, the kinase assay directly. Um, what I can say is Canada uh, has a smaller repertoire of DYRK kinases. We actually thought that this YAK1 was the only one, uh, which was how we came up with it as the putative target. Based on the human literature and the DYRKs, we looked for orthologs in, in our fungus, found YAK1, but we've actually recently discovered that there's another uh, DYRK that also seems to play a key role in this story uh, of filamentation. So great, great question. And I think the specificity is, is something to explore uh, further and we're engaged, not surprisingly, in some chemistry efforts as well to explore you know, additional molecules that might have better properties for our uh, drug development programs. I see another question uh, has come up. Uh, so thank you to Jason for those two questions. And now this one's from Greg. Is the stress response inhibited by some of the compounds related to the transporter that is targeted by others? Is the efflux transporter downstream in the stress response? So good question. Um, there's possible connections and there's possible components that are independent uh, with the stress response and efflux uh, related stories. So for the efflux, uh, we know that, uh, for example, for the Ciora story, um, you know, just taking out CDR1, this ABC transporter that's involved in efflux is sufficient to confer this hypersensitivity uh, to the azoles. No need to invoke any stress response, simply crippling efflux 
confer sensitivity by leading to increased azole intracellular accumulation, which is where the target is. So no need to invoke stress response there. But uh, as you may have seen, uh, we found um, that our compound had activity even as a single agent in the mouse model, where deletion of CDR1, which is data I did not show, uh, did not. So taking out that efflux transporter alone does not confer a virulence defect in this particular model, uh, whereas our compound does, which tells us um, that the compound may be doing something in that context in addition uh, to inhibiting that transporter or that it's affecting you know, the, something in the mouse uh, context as well. So that's an area that we're exploring, whether uh, our compound has an additional target that may modulate sort of virulence-related traits. Um, but at the moment, uh, the connectivity between efflux and stress response uh, remains an area to explore. So I think that's all the question currently in the in the chat. So also I want to know if there anybody in the in the room, room 120, if you have any question, then you can either type or let's see, anybody's monitoring the room. No question in 120. Oh, there's one more question. Yeah. Excellent. So I see a question from Chaiyang, uh, which is, what is the structural difference in the HSP90 N terminal between C. albicans and C. neoformans? That we're just trying to get to the bottom of. Uh, so I, it's that's a like that, that's a million dollar question, <laughs> and uh, you know something that uh, we're we're working on. A challenge is right. These their ligand induced conformational changes or changes that are happening accompanying ligand binding is is perhaps how I'll describe it. Um, so it it's all in in the context of of that perspective. So it makes it a little bit more tough, you know, to to model. So we're working on that. We don't necessarily have all of the candida and cryptococcus structures with the same compounds because the same compounds aren't necessarily binding, right? So that means then it's a little bit trickier uh, to, to nail that piece down, but it's very relevant and very interesting because we think um, there, could, there could be value in developing a broader spectrum fungal HSP90 inhibitor that would engage with both targets and not the human protein. There could also be different kinds of value for uh, having species specific as we think about you know, minimizing how widely antimicrobials are used to minimize sort of issues with resistance. So as long as you can very clearly diagnose which kinds of infection you have, then having a more specific agent could minimize sort of widespread use and minimize resistance. So great question and requires us to have the same, you know, both species HSP90 and terminal domains bound to the same set of ligands, uh, which um, at the moment we don't have that full set to now analyze. So before I let you go, Leah, I actually have a question. So yeah. considering the interest of the attended uh, audience, you know, my question is, you know, nowadays computational or structural prediction becomes more powerful or more reliable than before hopefully. And then what is your opinion on, you know, structure prediction or computational, you know, binding docking in drug discovery? So most of your data, your story shared today, are still, I would say, most of the experimental, right? So <laughs> what's your opinion on that? So uh, my sense, and again, I will uh, couch this, I'm not the computational biologist or the structural biologist, so uh, that, that leans to where <laughs> the kinds of data that I present. Um, but I, I will say uh, these approaches are incredibly powerful and can dramatically accelerate, you know, the kinds of, uh, you know, empirical experiments that are required, uh, you know, by scanning millions of molecules, you can then have much more focused uh, efforts to validate uh, predictions, you know, uh, experimentally. So I will note, I alluded to, I have a startup company called Bright Angel Therapeutics. And for that startup company, I kind of alluded to, we're taking a very different approach. Um, and I will note our co-founder uh, for the company is Schrodinger, uh, who is you know, a powerhouse in computational chemistry and in silico drug design. And so that's our strategy uh, in the company um, and has been a, a, key, a key way to sort of accelerate kind of discovery uh, of fungal selective molecules. So I think harnessing the power of you know, all of the advances in you know, physics and AI and, and uh, structural uh, analysis and in silico ligand binding um, is really helpful. Uh, and allows you to screen a much broader chemical space uh, and, and focus your synthetic efforts uh, appropriately. So we embrace that strategy, uh, but in a, in a different program that I didn't talk about today. Okay. Oh, so Leah, so I know it's 1 p.m., but we have one more question. 
Yeah, thank you. So that's from Robert, uh, that companies uh, might be more interested in compounds with broad spectrum activity over specific activity due to the cost of development and potential profit trade-offs. Absolutely. Uh, and our intention was certainly to develop a broad spectrum fungal specific HSP90 inhibitor. Uh, and that still is our intention. And I still think it's feasible based on advances. So we're learning a lot in this process. Uh, but we do know that these fungi like candida and crypto have diverged by like a billion years of evolution. So these are really different organisms. Uh, and, and so it's not surprising that um, their HSP90 is almost as difficult to, <laughs> to target uh, as the challenge of, of differentiating from the, the human. So I think there's a challenge, uh, but I also think there's, there's a, a path towards developing a broad spectrum fungal specific HSP90 inhibitor. We are uh, up to the challenge, we are working on it. But again, just given you know this moment of antimicrobial resistance, and we do realize that uh, the more a drug is deployed, the more rapidly resistance evolves. So there, there also could be a role for specific molecules, recognizing your point about the trade-off of developing the cost of developing a drug, and then the, the prevalence of resistance, which then hinders its utility. Let's see, no more questions. And thank you so much, Leah, for your enlightening talk. So we will give you 15 minutes or 10 minutes for a short break. Then Perfect. I will see you again in the graduate student meeting. Thank you, everybody, for attending this seminar. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.